Thank you so much. Thank you, James. Wow, what an introduction. And thank you, Heartland, for providing this forum in Scotland. Uh, this has been just an a, a invaluable resource to have uh, this, in this right next to the conference center, pushing back on everything that you're hearing in that, in that, in that conference room here in Glasgow. Uh, and we're going to go through this. This is going to be a, a wacky overview of everything that's happening at this summit, previous summits, and the key things you need to know. Um, I title it Build Back Bankrupt. Now, why is this called Build Back Bankrupt at UN Climate Summit? Well, we all know Boris Johnson, Joe Biden, their motto has been, since the COVID lockdowns have crippled countries, is Build Back Better. But we're finding out in quick order what they really meant was Build Back Bankrupt. My book, of course, Green Fraud, released in March 2021, and I'm honored to say that uh, Lord Moncton, James Taylor, other key people you've already heard speak are featured prominently in the book and cited and quoted. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. This book is uh, just on the entire climate agenda, but it is a U.S.-centered focus a lot on this. But I have a whole chapter on European as well and their version of the Green New Deal and the climate agenda. So let's start out. Glasgow, that's where we are right now, in Glasgow, Scotland, at the United Nations Climate Summit. 52 private jets have flown in over the last few, just in a little window of time on Sunday, according to the UK Daily Mail. We have President Biden's, I think, 80 or 85 uh, vehicle motorcade that came in. This is nothing unusual. I'm not going to dwell too much on the specifics of all this hypocrisy, but we all know what's going on. And we all know what it means. Prince Charles has warned we need critical change in the way we live. So we look to our leaders. Are they following that model? Well, this is one of them. This is Lady Gaga climate revolution t-shirt. She steps off her private jet in Sydney. One of the many examples. The UN, the 2020 UN climate report is not actually a scientific report. The IPCC is not a scientific panel. It's a political body masquerading as a science panel. And even the, UN, um, the Nobel Prize was awarded for a peace prize for political activism back in 2007. But this is one of the lead authors. <laughs> I think people need to start getting scared. So the stated goal of an IPCC lead author, which was released in August of this year, is for you to be scared. By the way, Jim Cosin also runs a climate risk firm, and uh, it's called the Climate Service. So he's also doing a little business on the side promoting this report. But he hopes the new UN reports will help change people's attitude and affect the way they vote. This is science in the 21st and year 2021. It's meant to scare you and it's meant to affect the way you vote. Science morphs into political lobbying. Ivo de Boer, the former UN climate official, report is going to scare the wits out of everyone. I'm confident these scientific findings will create new political momentum. Again, they're admitting it. And that's what these reports are designed to do is create political momentum at UN climate summits. Give us trillions or you will fry. This is the report from the IPCC uh, kidnappers. Floods, droughts, pestilence. We really mean it this time. Pay hair. Of course, they mean a lot of things. This is just a little article we found. This is from Tony Heller. 1995, the New York Times reported, at the most likely rate of rise, experts say most of the beaches on the East Coast of the United States will be gone in 25 years. Now, maybe uh, is Lord Moncton still in the room? Yeah, if you're good at math, uh, 25 years from uh, 1995 would have been the year 2000. And that's, uh, I don't think that most of the East Coast beaches have, uh, are disappeared. That's just a simple a prediction of what they would have done. 1972, we only have 10 years left to save the world from catastrophe. Maurice Strong. 1982, 18 years to save the world from catastrophe. The UNEP director. In 1989, we only have 10 years to save the world from the climate catastrophe. And that was Noel Brown, the UN uh, the, the UNEP director at the time. But did you know that uh, in 1864, when uh, Abraham Lincoln was president, the earliest known climate tipping point appeared. George Perkins Marshall warned of, quote, climatic excess unless men changed their ways. Uh, this is featured in my book. I found this actually from an MIT professor, Leo Marx, who had dug this up. But he, it's had all the same stuff that we hear today, deprivation, barbarism, extinction of species, climatic excess. And they're warning that, again, humankind. So this is deep within us, going back centuries, the idea that mankind is destroying the planet and that we should have some kind of ecological guilt. Senator Chuck Schumer, and that's a picture of a seance. 
uh, said if we would do more on climate, we'd have fewer of these hurricanes. In fact, he went further. He said, everyone knows, I believe was the exact quote. He said, everyone knows that if we knew, did more on climate. So this is implying that back, say, uh, you know, ha- you know, Kyoto or maybe Bali, had we had done more on climate, maybe had a better UN treaty, we'd have fewer hurricanes today. People in power actually believe this. This, of course, uh, it probably happened, but I can't say for sure, but this is Justin Trudeau. And then I told them that attacks can change the weather. This is the level of science we're dealing with at a UN climate conference, literally. That's not an exact quote, but he probably said it. Joe Manchin, I love this. This just came out of a couple weeks ago. Rolling Stone magazine. There's a half a trillion dollar uh, Biden initiative dealing with clean energy, climate, or you know, renewable energy, unreliable energy. Manchin is opposed to it. So Rolling Stone uh, said that Joe, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia has, quote, cooked the planet. And they think they mean it literally. This isn't a metaphor. West Virginia just cooked the planet. I don't mean that in a metaphorical sense. I mean it literally. Unless Manchin changes his negotiating position, he will be remembered as the man uh, who chose to condemn virtually every living creature on earth to a hellish future of suffering, hardship, and death because he voted against a budget bill in Washington. Let's repeat that. A hellish future on earth every man, woman, and child condemned because he voted against a budget bill. Bill McKibben, Senator Manchin's no vote on the budget bill will alter Earth's geologic record. Now, is there a geologist in the room? Can we have it? I want, a, I want an answer. Is that possible? Can one vote on a pork bill spending bill in Washington alter the geologic record? You know, we've heard of the, the Anthropocene, the Asian man. Are we going to have the Manchin Pocene? I don't know. How to, I'm, I'm probably butchering that. But this is the absurdity. This Rod Serling never said it, but hey, this would have made a great episode of Twilight Zone. A world where people believe the temperature of the planet can be controlled by giving the government more money, by more money to the government. This is the level. This is all you need to know about what's happening in Glasgow, Scotland right now. These people actually believe this horse bleep. I self-censored. Okay. How many times do we have to save the planet? Let's go back. Six years. I was there. Uh, and, and Lord Moncton was there, the previous speaker. I believe James, James Taylor was there. In Paris, years from now, this is Al Gore. This is after they successfully signed the Paris Agreement and everyone was exuberant. Year, this is Al Gore. Years from now, our grandchildren will reflect on humanity's moral courage to solve the climate crisis. They will look to December 12, 2015 as the day the community of nations finally made the decision to act. We're saved. How many times do we have to save? Okay, we were saved. John Kerry said, this is a tremendous victory for all citizens, said of Paris, not for any one country or bloc, but a victory for all the planet and future generations. That's the Paris Agreement. Historic day went bust. What happened? The French president at the time, 2015, history is coming. History is here. We have a historic day, a major date that will go down in the history of mankind. The date can become a message of life. Former British Prime Minister David Cameron, we've secured our planet for many generations. We did it, many generations to come, but here we are six years later, and there's nothing more important than that. So past, uh, President Obama said, hailed the Paris Agreement as the turning point for the world. We came together, but all these things have gone kaput. History forgot Paris. The, the, apparently, we won't always have Paris. Ban Ki-moon now says, well, history is a day to remember. Paris Agreement is a monumental success. But this is now Joe Biden here, build back bankrupt. What's happening? Bill B- Joe Biden comes to the Glasgow summit, falls asleep. Now, before we get mad at Joe Biden for falling asleep, I will defend Joe Biden. On the- he was listening to a disability rights activist talk on and on about extreme weather and all this nonsense on, on climate change and how man's causing it. Believe me. Anyone in this room would have fallen asleep. I do not fault him for falling asleep. If his aide hadn't woke him up, he would have slept through the whole thing. And I think they would have been better off for it. Okay. So COP26 now, after we heard about how Paris saved the planet, where we are today, this is literally the last chance saloon to save the planet, said Prince Charles just this week. The Glasgow Climate Summit is the last chance to listen to Mother Nature. So after Paris saved us, now we have one more chance to save us again. I don't know how many times we need to be saved. Youth activists call Glasgow the last chance for humanity. But wait, how many last chances do we get? Paris in 2015 was called the last chance. 
And that's an April 2015 article. Bali UN Climate Summit. Climate talks are the last chance to avoid catastrophe. 2007. UN Climate Summit 2014. The last chance needed for climate negotiations in Lima. Every summit is the last chance. Paris, the last chance for action. Now we're told by Time Magazine in this past week, and by the way, that's the cover. If any of you were on the fence, should I buy that? Look at that beautiful picture of John Kerry. Go out and buy this magazine now before it ends up for uh, recycling. This is what Time Magazine says of Glasgow. This year, the fate of our civilization is being determined in bland convention center meeting spaces. By the way, fully endorse that. It's a very bland convention center meeting space. They don't even have the NGO center nearby. The green zone's far away. It's, not, it's very bland. Slick corporate boardrooms and regal hotel balls. Definitely regal hotel balls, as you see the world leaders sipping on uh, champagne and wine and eating uh, all sorts of uh, appetizers as they talk about how the, the commoners, the masses, will be restricted. Whatever you go, it's hard to escape John Kerry's name. So we have a full profile of John Kerry in this magazine uh, right now. But they're saying the fate of our civilization, and I'm telling you, absolutely nothing is being determined next door except the fate of, the, of bankrupting nations. Greta Thunberg, I don't know what to say about this. For the first time in the last month, climate skeptics can now fully embrace Greta Thunberg's message. There's no reason to criticize her, make jokes. We can now fully endorse her. She has called this the blah, blah, blah summit. All the summits, the blah, blah. Here's what she said. 30 years of blah, 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 referring to the UN climate treaty process. There's no planet blah, 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 blah. Net zero, blah, blah, blah. Climate neutral, blah, blah, blah. This is all we hear from our so-called leaders. Words, words that sound great, but so far have led to no action or hopes and dreams. Empty words and promises. Now, we know this. She's now, this is, I call her moment of clarity. She now realizes that she actually truly believes, for whatever reason, that the earth is facing peril and these UN conferences are critical and that we have to save the planet. But she realizes that these are empty words and promises. This is nonsense. We need to embrace Greta. Here's the science behind what Greta is saying. Going back to 1970s, all of these UN summits, all these UN trees, one thing we know will come out besides hot air and empty promises is rising CO2 emissions. Nothing that happens at these summit has affected it and nothing is likely to ever to affect it, especially uh, what's funny is China, Russia, I'll get to this a little later, Saudi Arabia, decided not to attend. There's a reason none of these countries are here, because Joe Biden is doing the bidding for them. And we'll talk about that in a little minute here. Arnold Schwarzenegger's moment of clarity. Now, this is the guy who's led the Republican Party, if you will, on climate. But he's now admitting nothing is getting done at UN climate summits. This is a man who used to come regularly to these UN climate summits. I don't believe he's coming this year because he realizes the same thing that Greta Thunberg realizes. And here's another, this is a great chart because it shows you Rio, 1992, and it just shows you the climate agreements everyone they've had has done not even but this, no blip, nothing to CO2. So if you actually cared about climate change and rising CO2, the last place you'd want to be is Glasgow, Scotland. A little forward to this, I, when I talked last time at Heartland a couple of weeks ago, I did a whole thing on climate lockdowns. So they wanted how they were so excited about the climate, uh, the COVID lockdowns, and they want to morph them to climate lockdowns. Well, a little eerie, this is uh, was said in 2012, shutting down the whole economy is the only way of limiting global warming to 2C. This was Evo DeBoer. Now, interesting Think about that, because when COVID came along, they shut down basically the whole global economy, or at least severely impaired it, right in line with trying to meet their temperature goals, as stated by the UN, right in line with the degrowth movement, right in line with Kevin Anderson from the Tyndale Center calling for planned recessions to fight global warming. Uh, and this is just sort of eerie because, first of all, the two degree temperature, 1.5, we know from the climate gate emails it was, quote, they admit it was pulled from thin air, that it's a nonsense number. Um, Mike Holm uh, and uh, several others have just literally said it's nothing. It's just a political thing so that the people can have something to grab onto, kind of like a 97 percent consensus. It's an illusion. But we have others joining us here. Even James Hansen recently, the climate grandpa, or the movement's grandpa, has declared the Green New Deal nonsense. We need a real deal that understands how economics works. Once again, we can rally around James Hansen. Former Clinton Gore advisor Naomi Wolf, she's now, you know, I don't know what you call it, but having a transformation. She's shocked. She laments having voted for Biden. She's shocked at what he's done with endless lockdowns and the, all the mandates. But she's also turned against the Green New Deal, calling it fascism. 
Uh, and she says this is a straight up power grab. I believe we need to build new coalitions. Reach out to a James Anson. Reach out to a Naomi Wolf. This is amazing stuff when former allies turn against themselves. Now, Greta Thunberg, you've heard about the blah, blah, blah. But you may not know that just yesterday, Greta Thunberg showed up outside the halls here at Glasgow by the UN summit and said, you can shove your climate crisis up your arse. And she's out there chanting, no more whatever the F they're doing inside there, referring to the UN Climate Summit. So once again, I believe Greta Thunberg is now uh, you know, a fully and committed climate realist, at least when it, not this on the science, but when it comes to the process. She knows that what's going on here uh, is basically they can shove it up their arse. And I, I am so impressed. Again, Greta is not ceasing, is just not ceasing to impress me daily. I mean, she is coming around. She's actually uh, thinking for herself. This is amazing things to watch. Okay, so where are we here? The United States is here, Joe Biden. Under, we had energy dominance. In 2019, the United States, for the first time since Harry S. Truman was president, 1952, had more energy uh, production than consumption and more uh, energy uh, uh, where was it? Import, yeah, exports than imports. And this was shocking because no longer did we have to have endless wars in the Middle East. No longer did we, we could actually now have what I call energy dominance. We were the world's largest uh, producer of oil and gas. We were exactly where we wanted to be for the United States, both economically and national security state. And what's funny is now you have John Kerry, Joe Biden claiming that uh, climate change is a national security threat. Well, not when you, this is, this is the greatest solution to any national security threat is to have homegrown energy. Climate solutions in the UK, the, uh, the uh, UK power chief has warned the era of constant electricity as home is ending. Families have to get used to power only when it's available. And this is our future as we go down the green era of uh, these mandates, the Green New Deal type eras. In 1908, fossil fuels accounted for 85% of U.S. energy consumption in 2015, and today, more or less the same. Uh, total production of solar and wind at last count was less than 4%. They want to turn that 4% into some magical net zero future in the next decade. And, but the thing is, they'll obviously fail, but they are going to do massive economic harm in trying. Um, Bloomberg News, 2019, global energy demand means the world will keep burning fossil fuels. Unreliables, I, don't, I won't spend a lot of time here because we all know about wind and solar, but just some of the key points. Keystone pipeline, all underground or uh, uh, you know, part of it above ground there, but just very simple using a time-tested old uh, pipeline technologies. Lithium mine for hybrid cars, but it's all about the environment. And what not mentioned here is that Chinese rare earth mining is a near monopoly, buying up Africa, using uh, child labor, Uyghur slaves in China. If you're talking about ethical energy, if you're, you know, you go to Starbucks and the, the liberals like to sit around and talk about, you know, we need social justice and equity, and yet they want all of their renewable energy basically making us more and more reliant on China. This is the great delusion, the electric bike plugging it in as, you know, the uh, power plants, fossil fuel run behind it. He's given thumbs up. This is what people don't realize. Wind farms produce practically no electricity during Britain's cold snap unreliable, weather-dependent energy, we're going backwards. Constructing and replacing each wind turbine consumes 30 tons, 30,000 tons of iron ore, 50,000 tons of concrete, 900 tons of plastic, all sorts of issues with landfill. This is our future that's being forced upon us almost immediately. Uh, an interesting, a high-level executive from Russia's Gazprom a few months ago said, it looks like the West will have to rely more on what it calls hostile regimes for its energy supply. Well, yes, when you shut down American energy and, and European energy, uh, we have now an 11-year high of Russian oil imports. We have um, uh, a, a Chinese more dependence on rare earth, and we have the Biden administration begging OPEC to increase oil production as he shuts down American energy. This is bonkers on any level you look at it. But now China, are they committing? China's not even here at this summit. Why bother? As I said, Joe Biden is doing their bidding. But China puts growth ahead of climate with surge in coal-powered fire, fire uh, mills. They're estimating that there's one a week being built coal-fired power, coal power plants. 
Study by the, on the Green New Deal domestically in the United States, even using the UN science, the impact would be barely distinguishable from zero. This is according to the American Enterprise. So again, if we face the climate catastrophe, why would you do something like the Green New Deal? You would actually do the exact opposite of the UN climate process here in Glasgow or a Green New Deal. You would actually want prosperity, wealth, technological innovation, economic growth, because that is the best way to get yourself out of any environmental problem. And it's an amazing thing because they all, I have a whole chapter in my book in the 1970s, they literally called for the same exact Green New Deal, UN climate treaty solutions in the 70s for the man-made global cooling scare coming ice age that they had. You had, and government regulations can't control the climate. I interviewed a University of Pennsylvania geologist, Robert Giegengack. None of the strategies that have been offered by the US government, EPA, UN, anyone else has the remotest chance of altering the climate, even if you believe it's controlled by carbon dioxide. So I wanna tell people to keep calm and trust the experts. That's sort of the message here at this conference here in Glasgow. Well, let's see. The New York Times has recently said this year, critical thinking leads to misinformation. Don't go down the rabbit hole of critical thinking. Critical thinking as we're taught isn't helping in the fight against misinformation. So you have that. If you start engaging in critical thinking, you are guilty of misinformation. You're likely to be deplatformed, defunded, and fired. Forbes magazine weighed in. You must not do your own research when it comes to science. Why would you need to? Just trust the experts. That's all we gotta do. Questioning authority has become too much of a good thing, and it's killing people. Remember the 1960s, the Pentagon Papers, anti-war, the progressive activists, the hippies. None of them, they didn't want to question authority. They just wanted to trust Richard Nixon. Why shouldn't we do the same with Joe Biden in the United Nations? Let's trust authority because questioning it is killing people. For too many people, do your own research means following a social media post into a rabbit hole of misinformation. So just trust all the health experts, all the climate experts, and move on. If you can't do that, well then just, you know, the Slate Magazine, it's time to give up on facts. Just give up on all the facts, or at least temporarily lay them down and, and, and use something else they recommend. Emotions, forget about science, forget about logic, forget about that, just use emotional appeal to nonsense, even if it's completely factually wrong. It's, it's time to give up on those facts. Here's a good visual of all the major organs of our media uh, about to murder the truth. You got Facebook, NBC, CNN, and Twitter there. Are you sure this will bring rain? Asked the ancient uh, Aztecs. Shut up and listen to the experts. So that's my message today. Listen to the experts. This organ sacrifice and this blood sacrifice will bring the rain. Trust the experts. The media's moment of clarity as we're facing now a global energy crisis of shortages and price strings. The global energy is the first of many in the clean power area. Now, I believe Bloomberg actually ended up pulling one of these visuals because I think it got, you know, it got a lot of pressure because this article was an amazing article to leak out of Bloomberg Green, which is set up to promote green energy. But they actually tell us that a global transition to clean energy means energy crisis and gas shortages. So there's some in the media that get it. Again, coalition building. I'm, I'm amazed that Bloomberg Media did this article. The New York Times, a, scare, a scary energy winner is coming. Don't blame the Greens. This is Tom Friedman, the man who praised China's one party rule and uh, loves it from 2009 and loves the idea of one party state and wants to basically keep this going. He likes the idea of a declared emergency and unelected bureaucrats now running climate policy. But Tom Friedman is worried that someone might get the wrong idea and think that high gas, high energy prices and shortages are somehow related to green energy. If the winter is as bad as some experts predict, I fear we'll see a populist backlash to the whole climate green movement. Can you imagine anything more horrible? You can already smell it coming. They are very scared, which tells us that we need to step into this and make it so that people know why there's shortages and energy prices skyrocketing in both Europe and the United States and around the world. Energy crunch, this is uh, AP News just last week, I believe. Energy crunch hits global recovery as winter approaches. The poor in Brazil are choosing between paying for food or electricity, and that's coming globally thanks to build back bankrupt policies. New scientists, they're beyond Tom Friedman, and I mentioned Bloomberg was correct in saying it's green energy that's gonna cause this. 
Tom Friedman's terrified it's going to affect the climate. But new scientists, hey, blame fossil fuels, not renewables for the UK's energy crisis. Why not just say the most absurd thing and do that? So they're, they're actually trying to turn it around and blame fossil fuels. And we talk about Afghanistan. There's a lot of stuff about leaving Afghanistan and the country collapsing. It wasn't Biden's fault. Just I'm here to stand up for Joe Biden. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't poor military planning. Climate change. How do we know this? Because I trust the experts. CBS News, how climate change helps the, uh, the Taliban strengthen the Taliban. Rural Afghanistan has been rocked by climate change. The past three decades have brought floods, droughts, destroyed crops. They even say uh, that the Taliban wasn't even aware of how it helped them, but it was climate change that, that, that reason that gave them a rise uh, to power. And by the way, Floods, droughts, there's no increase in global floods, no increase in global droughts, and crop production all throughout Afghanistan, I believe James Taylor had pointed this out, is up uh, dramatically. So just this is completely fact-free CBS article, but they're doing the bidding trying to protect uh, President Biden politically. Newsweek, hey, you know what? The Taliban's not so bad after all. Seeking world recognition, Taliban offers to help fight terror and climate change. So how bad could the Taliban be? Let's, come on, if they're going to fight climate change, they should be welcome here at a table of honor in Glasgow. Interesting, just this past week or so, China meets with Kerry only virtually. In September, he, Ch Kerry made a 7,000-mile trip to China, but despite the long journey, China's foreign minister only met with him virtually and said that climate collaboration could not be an oasis away from the other rifts. So this is Time Magazine. John Kerry traveled around the world. China refused to meet him face to face. Joe Biden requested a meeting with China's head. Uh, and, but guess what? Proposal to meet face to face, not happen. That China refused to meet with Joe Biden. So wait, that's interesting. Maybe China just doesn't like face to face meetings. Maybe they just like to do everything virtually. Uh, I'm sorry, Tal Chinese officials in the Taliban met in sign of warming ties. Somehow, they didn't have time to meet John Kerry or Joe Biden in person, but they made it a point to meet with Taliban leadership in person, and they are lusting after Afghanistan's rare earth mining, which they were going to probably have complete and free access to China. So just another example, as, the, as we in the West hand over our energy security to China, Russia, OPEC, and also the Taliban. China may align itself with Taliban and try to exploit Afghanistan's rare earth metals. This is on CNBC. U.S. climate policy is the greatest national security we, threat we face. You can also say UN, UK. No reason for China, Russia, Saudi Arabia to be here at Glasgow. Biden is doing their bidding. Russia, China, OPEC, uh, um, at the UN summit are smiling broadly. This means more Russian oil imports, more European reliance on Russia, more US reliance on China for their renewable, 90% of solar panels coming from China to the US, and more uh, reliance on OPEC, as Biden administration literally begging OPEC to increase oil production. This is the state of affairs that we have here at this summit today. I've gone a little long, but I thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. There's my company, CVAC Committee for Constructive Tomorrow. I have my other book, which deals more with the science of global warming as well as policy, Politically Incorrect, came out in 2018. And we had a movie, Climate Hustle 2, which deals with all the same issues in exactly what we're talking about, released last year with Kevin Sorbo. I think you really enjoy it. It's a climate comedy dealing with people shrinking humans, the whole agenda to force us to eat meat and insects. Uh, that's how you can reach me, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you for this opportunity, Jim. Thank you. Great job, Mark. Thank you very much. So Jim Lakely had to go attend to one matter at our hotel where we're hosting this, so he'll be back momentarily uh, with questions okay. uh, that have been uh, sent in. I imagine there are quite a few. Um, in the meantime, while we wait for Jim, a couple things that, that jump out at me, Mark, at your talk, um, when you mentioned Afghanistan. Yes, um, I saw those same claims in the media about global warming being the reason why the Taliban won. And, and they say, well, because of, because of global warming, which we caused, we, we sowed the seeds of our own demise because Afghanistan farmers cannot feed their families anymore. And, and they blamed it on the government. So whether there was warming, or, or excuse me, you know, regardless of what the other issues are, if if you can't feed your family, then you're going to rise in opposition. Well, it sounds good, and that's what CBS says, that's what others said. But then you look at the data, because the United Nations keeps meticulous data on crop production by country and for the world. 
And so we looked it up at Climate Realism. We posted an article on this. According to the objective data, Afghanistani crop production has doubled in the past 25 years. And in fact, there's been no declining trend at all in terms of precipitation either. Of course, it doesn't matter. Crop production is up. Their narrative is hogwash. But what they wanted to do was save Joe Biden's posterior and at the same time blame global warming. They just make stuff up when they can. Anyway, Jim is back, and I imagine he has some questions for Mark. Take it away. We do. Mark, sure. uh, you, you talk too fast and you talk too loud. I don't think they could hear you down the street oh, at, okay. uh, <laughs> at, at, at COP26, so you might want to start let's start over again, a little slower. Okay, a little here louder. we go. Great. All right. Well, you actually, uh, Mark, you, you're not be uh, surprised to know you had a lot of fans in the chat. Oh, uh, great. Thanks. They say you're uh, hilarious, you're funny. Uh, um, you should be a stand-up comic and just do climate <laughs> comedy out there, so... Uh, Take that for what no, it's no, worth. Yeah, I don't think you get, <laughs> uh, but one of the uh, one of the comments here was actually a discussion back and forth between uh, somebody named Mike Heath and also RC. And I'm just trying to uh, crystallize this here. And maybe you can just kind of address this this topic. And that's that um, the effectiveness of Al Gore and uh, and, and other alarmists and the um, uh, the mob, as they call them here. Their character assassination efforts on guys like you and, and the Harlan Institute and James Taylor and uh, scientists who are skeptical of human caused climate catastrophe. Um, you know, they they have the media on their side. They have well, they have industry on their side yes. now too. And they've they've basically bullied the world into uh, treating anyone skeptical of, of climate calamity caused by man. Uh, you know, just pushing them out of out of society. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about. You know, that dynamic, I mean, you've been in this game for a long time, and, and how, how do you think, and then the other side of that coin, another comment that somebody had was that, well, they're doing that for a reason. They're banning, I think, um, uh, Axios had a story about, about how um, social media companies, again, another story about this, social media companies have to silence uh, and ban anybody who's skeptical of, of, uh, of climate alarmism from social media companies. So t talk a little bit, if you could, about, about that dynamic and how, how do you fight back out that? A lot of people listening to this would want to know. The fight back is hard. Well, Chris, first of all, Biden's EPA has a scientific advisory board, and they just purged um, so I don't, almost 50 scientists from it. And a lot of them had industry ties. But when you're regulating, as the EPA does, industry, you have academic scientists, you have industry. The idea is an academic comes up with a, the idea that sounds plausible, but then the, the other scientists who have experience with industry in their past can say, no, that would never work for this. They've gotten rid of all those scientists. So that's one thing. So now, purging nearly 50 scientists at the EPA advisory board, what are they going to say next year when there's a new proposal by the Biden administration? There was a 100% consensus of all EPA scientists. This is a good plan. You know what? We didn't have any dissent among the EPA scientists. And you start thinking, wait a minute, you didn't have any dissent because you just purged 50 scientists who would have dissented. This is how a consensus is crafted. In real time with COVID, you can see uh, scientists, uh, uh, you know, uh, chem um, epidemiological, uh, you know, Nobel Prize winning epidemiologists disinvited from a scientific conference in, I believe it was Europe, because he didn't support political lockdowns as a solution to a virus outbreak. So they're deplatformed, they're shut down, we're watching it in real time. So within a year or two, you're gonna say, well, I don't see any scientists out there who are against lockdowns. They're all, there's no one, there's no one left. They send a message to young uh, to scientists. The same thing happened in climate decades ago. The reason I'm bringing up the COVID is because we're watching it in real time. We're watching it in real time at the EPA with the Science Advisory Board. We're watching it in real time how they're shutting down anyone who opposed, again, we're not talking about epidemiology, just anyone who opposes lockdowns or any of the mandates that they're proposing. So, it's, you know, the whole idea of deplatforming and shutting everyone up, it's very effective, especially when you have complete media control, corporate collusion, massive social media companies. It's not a fact check. All it is is a consensus check. So if you say anything that's, dis that's out of line with the World Health or UNIPCC, it's back to the trusty experts. They don't care if you're right or not. They don't care what your underlying study is. And we're seeing this over and over. All they care is that you agree with the conclusion of the experts you're supposed to trust. So the way to fight back with it at this point, I think we just need mass resistance. We need anything we can think of. I know President Trump is trying some new social media company they claim is going to be able to bypass it. I don't know. We'll see. That sounds very uh, sketchy that they could actually overcome this, at least one company. 
Uh, but we just need to figure out a way. I saw today Breitbart News is actually being targeted. Washington Post, uh, some study, they're going directly at it, saying it's the most cited climate denial source of information. So, and I tried to do it as an experiment just today. I did a search for Breitbart News and the article that the Washington Post was citing. It doesn't come up anywhere on Google. You cannot find it. It's just they're whitewashing search results now where you can't even find sources. They're just, they're, so the way to fight back I don't know. We, we have to just keep resisting everything. And I, I don't even, I guess it's all about narrative control, it, whether it's the, the repression of the COVID lockdowns or trying to do the, the climate lockdowns. I think we just have to fight on every angle and just keep, you know, resisting all these, all the mandates, all this stuff and try to somehow, I think we need, I wouldn't have said this two years ago. I think we need to break up big tech monopolies. It's like a, we need a Teddy Roosevelt style trust buster. I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but I think that's the, the most logical way forward. Well, your presentation certainly had a lot of passion, might even say emotion in it. <laughs> and, and you think, and, it, it, and there's some comments that reflect this in the, uh, in the chat room here on YouTube. And it's that the scientists that the Heartland Institute works with and CFAC works with, and you've participated in all, pretty much all of our major yes. climate conferences, and we go, we travel the world together all, and, do the, yes. and do this, and this, it's very fun. But, uh, you know, and then Christopher Monk in his presentation, very heavy on science and facts. And the other side tends to argue with emotion. And, um, you know, Greta Thunberg is a, is a great example of that. I mean, how are you supposed to argue with a kid, right? You know, well, she's an adult now. But, yeah. you know, it's this emotional appeal that, you know, well, from, from Save the Polar Bears and, and all of that stuff. Uh, and so the argument is that you can't beat an emotional argument with facts. It just doesn't land with people. And it seems that um, despite the passion you just displayed here, that... Uh, is that always is that dynamic ever going to flip around? Well, I think one of the ways you have to flip it is just the sarcasm, humor, reverse it in their face. We saw Al Gore here yesterday. Our, our CFAX, uh, Craig Rucker asked him about his 34 times the average American's electricity use. Al Gore completely didn't react. His staffer, we're out of time, we're out of time, we no more questions. Just literally terrified that they would ask him a question. You've got to expose them and you've got to, you can use emotion on our side. You can use the emotion. We're facing a huge energy crisis. Let's pin this on who it belongs to, the green energy mandates, and use emotion. Let's show the senior citizens who can't afford their heat. Let's show those on fixed income. We can do the same thing and we have to because you know, you can't just, the facts are very important, but we have to give up on critical thinking and facts. That's what the media says. So let's do it. Let's go with more emotion. So, so we'll see. But it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. Um, but the UN still is forced to let us in, which is, is, which is interesting. Although even yesterday, we went for a brief time and we're immediately, uh, UN officials are already harassing us and chasing us down a hall. I mean, it's, a, it's amazing. We're, I, I think we're under the microscope when we go in these conferences. But uh, don't be afraid of using emotion and humor and sarcasm because that's some of our best weapons, especially one of the greatest themes coming out of this conference is just the, the hypocrisy. I mean, literally you have, this is the new religion of the ruling class, the idea of these people coming together. They want to make your summer vacation like the old days where only the wealthy could afford the summer holiday at the, uh, you know, at the shore. They're what they're doing. It. They want to get rid of private car ownership. They want to get rid of free travel. They want to make airlines incredibly expensive. They want to make heating your home expensive. They want to, they want to regulate every aspect. So we have to fight back. But this is it. The elite agenda. It's not going to affect the Al Gore's, the Jeff Bezos is here. It's not going to affect Bill Gates. It's not going to affect the you know the World Economic Forum members. But it's going to affect all the rest of us. It's time mass resistance. I just keep saying that over and over. Um, and I, and I mean it across the board. So the, the, but the big problem, though, of course, is not only does everything we just mentioned and other people talked about this, but they're getting the financial institutions. And that's the problem. You're not even going to be able to fund fossil fuel energy anymore. So we're in this deep uh, and it's it's a, the fight of our life, basically, the fight for freedom. I, I don't want to say it's last chance or, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> like they say for the U.N. summits. But this is it. We're this is about the last year and a half have accelerated all these trends. Thank you.